All right. We are now live. Welcome, everybody, to the second ever episode of Door to Door. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago, we had Kyle Fuller on talk about his book, Above, uh, Below the Rim. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, former Commodore linebacker, uh, one-time SEC Player of the Week, two-time bowl champion, and most importantly, two-time victor over the bad guys at the University of Tennessee. Mr. Chase Garnum is here with us. Chase, how are you doing today? Good, good. How are you doing? I uh, can't complain. You know, I live in Wisconsin now. I woke up and it was snowing, so my life is, is living the dream, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's All been right, a so, day here, but hasn't been, hasn't been cold so far, so, so that's been good. Well, you know what? I heard uh, I heard people complaining this week about you know why people weren't at the Florida game because it was down in the 50s and it was too cold to attend. And then I uh, I, can't, I can't buy that for a second. 50 degrees is that's football weather. Yeah. Well, the thing was it was it was a little bit of a surprise. I think it was supposed to be like high 50s, low 60s that day, and, and I wore a really light um, jacket, and it got it got into the 40s during the game. I would say it was it was pretty chilly. Um, yeah. So it was probably a surprise that that caught people more than anything. Okay. So when you go to the games, are you down at the sideline? Are you with the team most of the time? No, absolutely not. Um, I keep forgetting to get tickets to all the games. I mean, I've only been to a few. I went to South Carolina, um, Georgia, at Georgia, and Athens. Uh, me and some friends took a trip down there. And then I went to this week's past, this, the game this past week. Um, and I actually didn't have tickets. I forgot to get tickets on, on Tuesday. Usually I get them from one of the guys that's still on the team. They just give me a, a family um, section ticket. But... I was actually just tailgating with some friends, wasn't planning on going, and, and a fan was kind enough to give me a ticket. So that was much appreciated, and, and I enjoyed the game for about a half and, and then took off because it was a little, little cold for me. So. <laughs> All right. So when you go down to the tailgates, the people recognize you most of the time. They know who you are. They, uh, they remember you from the good old days of 2013. <laughs> um, I really haven't been to, to any of the tailgates before this, this past weekend. Um, Kerry Spear and Chase White and I uh, and some friends um, were tailgating and, and some fans recognized us. But, I mean, uh, I wouldn't say we're, we're very recognizable. Um, I know Chase White's lost about 40 pounds. I've lost 30 pounds. Kerry's recognizable. I mean, everybody knows Kerry's a fan favorite. So he was kind of the first guy they recognized, and a couple of people came over. But, um, yeah, not too much. All right, very cool. Very cool to see you you're still hanging out with those guys. Obviously, we were pretty sad to see uh, see Kerry not make it with the, uh, with the Eagles. But... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm sure he's doing well. Hopefully, we'll get him on to door to door soon. See what he feels, how he feels about the whole murder leg nickname that we yeah, definitely made a good guest. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, tell us all about your life now. Obviously, you're still in Nashville. Uh, last time we saw you, you're coming off tryout with Ty- Def Bay. What happened with uh, with your post uh, post graduate football career, and what are you doing now? Yeah, so um, I had the opportunity with Tampa Bay. Uh, they didn't draft any defensive players in the draft, so my agent and I thought that that would be a good opportunity, particularly with them uh, moving back to the Tampa 2 defense, which is uh, which was our base defense at Vanderbilt when, when Coach Shoup was here. Um, you know, minicamp was interesting. Uh, it was mostly 7-on-7. Seven seven. I think they ended up taking two guys, a tight end, and, and maybe maybe a DB or something. Um, at, at that point, it, it's pretty. It's it's a long shot um, for guys that are that are undrafted and didn't, didn't initially have free agent deals. Um, so I could have gone and tried out with some other teams um, and hoped to, to stick with somebody. But um, because of, of how much of a long shot it was, I just decided that um, I was done. And, and I kind of wasn't really done after um, senior year and, and kind of the injuries. Um, so I was I was not too disappointed. Um, didn't haven't really thought too much about it since actually. Uh, but then I took the rest of the summer off for the most part, kind of hung out at home, hung out with some friends um, that are still in school at Auburn, spent some time there, uh, then came back up to Nashville uh, where uh, one of my good friends from school, Fitz Lassing and Bridges were up here. Uh, Bridges was still doing summer workouts and Fitz was about to go off to Chicago uh, where he had a job waiting for him. And um, then uh, Richard Kent actually got in touch with me uh, about working with his company um, I hadn't. I had just started the, the process of searching for a job. Um, yeah, so I've been working uh, with IQ Talent Partners, which is an executive search firm that primarily does recruiting for Silicon Valley startups um, for the past four months, and it's been really good. And then actually, Kerry Spear and, and Javon Marshall are both working with me now too. So we've got four former Vandy guys all working with the same company, which has got to be a record. Um, so it's been good. Um, 
the, the, the company's growing really, really fast, and uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it so far. So how, how big is this company that can fit four Vandy guys on the no, roster? Well, our, uh, one of our founding partners, who's a Vandy grad, is, is a big fanboy, so okay. kind of did us a favor and, and helps us get a job. Uh, but, um, yeah, we have about 15 uh, people in the research division in Nashville. Our business development's out in Silicon Valley. Um, it's where our partners are based. Okay. But yeah, we're we're growing really fast, and we can we can hardly support ourselves right now. So I think we're we're looking to get close to maybe seventy people within the next two years. So yeah, it's exciting. All right, that's that's pretty cool. So all right, let's talk about a little bit more about your Vandy career. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. All right, so you were recruited by Bobby Johnson. You played yeah. as a true freshman under Robbie Caldwell, and you developed into a starting high caliber SEC linebacker under James Franklin. Uh, now, how did the culture at Vandy change in the locker room surrounding the football team? How did it change under each coach? Yeah, um, yeah, coming in, um, there wasn't nearly there wasn't nearly the sense of pride that we ended up establishing um, once Coach Franklin came aboard. Um, things weren't there was there was a sense of complacency. Um, the seniors didn't weren't as invested um, as as the seniors were in the following years. I think that's the biggest difference. Coach Franklin really brought a sense of urgency. Um, and he demanded um, a level of competitiveness from from the players and the coaches that was pretty wild. Like, it, was, it was pretty crazy. Things 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 got got wild when he first got there in terms of how much we were sacrificing and putting in in the weight room and on the field. Um, but yeah, they they really just gave us a lot of confidence. Um, and we had never worked as hard as we were working, um, so we, we certainly wanted to go out there each Saturday and execute after after all that we put into it. All right, so going back to your Saturdays, I mean, you you came from a background where you were a pretty overlooked recruit, uh, and maybe didn't have as much interest as a lot of other guys, and you came from being uh, what rivals had you as a two-star guy, and you went from that status to immediately being a contributor as a true freshman for an SEC team. How did that feel to make that kind of jump and, and start to prove everyone wrong? Yeah, I honestly don't think it's something I really thought too much about, um, even then and even now. Um, I was a two-star. Uh, a lot of the guys that ended up being successful um, in my class and in the class above me were, were two stars. I know Walker, Jordan, uh, yeah. Steve, Steve Clark was a two-star. There was a good. There was a good bit of us. It was almost. Like there was a negative correlation <laughs> with the uh, recruiting stars, and it's like the guys that, that weren't rated as high uh, performed uh, maybe a little better than some of the guys that might have been a high three star or, high, or a four star. Um, I think a lot of that had to do with with Coach Johnson's staff's ability to evaluate talent and, and project guys that that could probably put on some weight and had the frame to fill out and be successful in SEC. Uh, I think they focus more of their attention. Um, with their recruiting process on, on talent evaluation and kind of finding some, some hidden gems compared to Coach Franklin's recruiting style of, of being more charismatic and using his personal brand to attract recruits. Uh, I think it was a good combination of, of having a lot of guys that were underrated and willing to put in the work that Coach Franklin asked of us and willing to sacrifice because we were kind of underdog guys. Um, that, I mean, that had a lot of talent. Um, we, we did. We certainly did. And I think um, that really, it was a good match. And, and Coach Franklin definitely got it in at the right time and had the right guys to, to implement his system. Ray, right, yeah, one of the, the most underrated parts of Bobby Johnson's reign was his ability to take those two-star guys and turn them into high-round draft picks, uh, besides Jay Cutler, Chris Williams, and now, most recently, Jordan Matthews. Obviously, some great pros that came out of the system from there that were really not too highly regarded coming out of high school. Um, but let's let's talk a little bit more about James Franklin and his brand. Sure. You were playing your last collegiate game right around the time the rumors began to fly that he was going to ditch Vanderbilt and head to Penn State. Uh, now, from a player standpoint, how did you think Coach Franklin handled his departure, and were there any hard feelings that may have lingered, not only with your class, but with some of the guys that still are on campus and playing football every Saturday? Yeah, I know. I know some of the younger guys took it more personally than, than the older guys did. Um, we were obviously done with the program, um, weren't going to be around, and, and it wasn't going to affect us as much as it is affecting them. Um, but in terms of that week of, of preparation at the bowl game, when that stuff started coming out, it was mostly Texas rumors then. Right. It was. It was honestly unbelievable how little the team paid attention to it. Um, 
We That's really great. didn't talk about it in meetings at all. No one really was even talking about it in their hotel rooms um, that that much. So it was impressive that we were able to kind of put that um, kind of aside and, and just get it done in terms of getting um, the win in a bowl game. Yeah, no, that's good to hear because a lot of times you hear teams say that we're not letting this affect us or we're, we're staying focused on the game. And a lot of times you wonder, eh, it sound, it sound, it kind of sounds kind of shady. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it seems like uh, not just with the football team but uh, with the basketball team as well, the things that are being said at face value really carry through all the way to the core, which is yeah, something nice about being a Vandy fan. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's, let's talk about the team this year. Uh, Vandy, coming off one of their stronger defensive efforts on Saturday, uh, really did a good job of, of shutting floor down in short yard situations until the defense got run down a little bit towards the end of the game. Yeah. Um, as former defensive captain of the team, do you see any major problems with this defense that go beyond maybe their relative youth? Obviously, you have a lot of young starters, a lot of freshmen contributing to the team. Um, and then on top of that, do you have faith in Derek Mason's switch to the 3-4? Do you think that's the right system for this team and for this personnel? Yeah, those are, those are all really good questions. I don't know if I can give you a really good answer for it. But um, I think we lost a lot of a lot of experience on defense. We certainly have, have some talent this year. Uh, the thing that experience gives you is it gives you the ability to disguise a little better, um, mm -hmm. which is which is really important. It's, it's, it's more important than I think people realize. Uh, things like that and, and fitting up the run game exactly right. Yeah. It's really important, and then whenever you're installing a new defense, those are the things that that you're probably not doing as well as, as you should um, in order to be successful. Um, I know that I've seen some some interesting rotations in terms of the players that are playing, which which has surprised me a little bit. We did we do have a few senior guys that have that have gotten some reps and were projected to be starters this year had the previous staff stayed. Um, I think when you have a new coaching staff, it gives players. Um, they all start off on, on even uh, footing in terms of learning the defense. So the guys that might have had an edge with the previous staff in terms of knowing the scheme um, and therefore being more productive, uh, they don't have that edge anymore. And it, it really just comes down to, to athleticism and, and ability to execute the new scheme. And so I can't really speak on, on that too much. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, there's there's definitely been some, some, some surprises, yeah. Um, so – I, this, this just kind of popped in my head. Uh, obviously, very talented guy, Caleb Zubike. Uh, mm -hmm. Still really waiting on a, a breakout performance from him, a breakout year. And I think part of the, the issue with him this season is that he's, he's been shifted all over the field. He's played a bunch of da downs with his hand in the dirt at, on the defensive line. He's played a bunch of downs standing up as an outside linebacker. With a player like that, obviously, he's, he's extremely athletic, but he's also got the bulk to to really be a tremendous pass rusher on the line. Yeah. Well, where do you see him fitting in best from a football standpoint? Is he an outside linebacker, or should he be a defensive lineman? What do you think? Yeah, it's funny you ask that, because I've had conversations with Caleb about this uh, when, the, when the staff first came aboard. <laughs> he, he was really excited about getting the chance to, to stand up as an outside linebacker and be a pass rushing specialist. Um, Caleb's extremely strong and raw in his techniques in a lot of ways. Um, I wouldn't say he's the most fluid person, and I think it takes a certain amount of fluidity to, to be successful when you're dropping into the flats and pass coverage and some of the responsibilities uh, the three or four outside linebackers have. Uh, I think he's, he's, he's a 4-3 he's a at the end. But in this defense, I think um, his best spot is, is the five technique, not only for himself but, but for the overall um, benefit of the defense. Uh, we have we have a little bit more depth at the three four outside linebacker position with uh, Weatherly Wynn, uh, Westman, right. some of the other guys. I think I think we need him at five. And I think that's that's where his um, skills will be best utilized. All right. Well so let's let's switch gears here. Let's go from uh, your ex uh, from your experience on the field and what you think of the team now. Let's go to your uh, a major part of your college experience off the field. Uh, you were a plaintiff in one of the biggest lawsuits to ever hit the NCAA, Ed O'Bannon's antitrust suit. Uh, that suit, uh, which was successful, entitles college athletes to financial compensation for the use of their likeness. Um, now, what compelled you to join that case while you're still an active athlete at Vanderbilt? Yeah, so I actually had an internship going into my senior year this summer, um, if you're familiar with the, the HOD internship, it's, it's kind of the culmination of your, your curriculum. Um, yeah. 
I was working for a mobile app company. Uh, they asked me to do a little bit of uh, research uh, on the NCAA's bylaws and their rule book. Rule book. Um, and I started really kind of delving into to a lot of the different bylaws and restrictions that the NCAA has in place on athletes, and, and it kind of got me thinking a little bit about some different things. It's something I'd always followed um, to some degree, uh, but, you know, I think a lot of guys don't really think about it too much. You're so busy with, with school and football, you don't really think about uh, the NCAA and the rules and, and, and how they affect your life um, and whether or not they're fair. So it's something that, that I... I s I had followed the, the actual abandoned um, versus NCAA case for a while, saw that they amended their, their argument to include current athletes, and I thought it would be a good way to kind of take some initiative and um, be a part of something that I, that I really believed in. So. so with that, did an attorney reach out to you, or did you seek them out to, to express your interest in being part of the case? Yeah, I actually, I actually sought them out. Um, Quick Google search, found out which <laughs> which uh, law firm was representing O'Bannon. Uh, sent him an email, and I think I maybe had three days left before in order to join it. So I joined it last minute. And they must have been thrilled to have you. It seemed like it was relatively limited athlete uh, participation there. You were one of six active athletes. Is that right? Um, it was a six. It was six initially, and I think one person dropped out. Okay. All right, so uh, let, let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Judge Claudia Wilkins, she ruled in your favor, but she also limited uh, the amount the NCAA can pay out and also capped the uh, – basically said that athlete, college athletes can't do their own endorsement deals, can't, uh, can't endorse product while they're still an amateur athlete. Yeah. Are those limits a concern for you, or do you think that the ruling was ultimately fair? Well, the one the, the, the part about endorsement deals was, was particularly surprising. Um, that was one of the, the main reasons uh, I joined it. I thought that was that was a no brainer in terms of um, athletes being able to to sell their own name, image, and likeness for endorsement purposes. Uh, I think that um, would be really beneficial to athletes in, in learning how to um, kind of establish their own personal brand and market themselves. Um, and earn a little bit of extra money on the side, and I don't really see how that would uh, harm the school in any way, uh, so or alter their educational experience. So that that one was a little surprising, and I'm still not exactly sure why she didn't um, grant an injunctive release from that bylaw. But yeah. All right. Um, now there was a big part uh, of your testimony that revolved around uh, signing over basically your likeness and. And uh, how you objected to that originally, and uh, and and had an issue with that with uh, I, I guess with the Vanderbilt uh, compliance board there, was that something that you saw from other uh, members of the football team as well, or were you more of a unique case in that most athletes are, are willing just to sign it over and get on the field and play? Yeah. Um, well, I never really read what we were signing too closely until my senior year. Um, at, the, at that point, my senior year, whenever we were signing the material, it's usually the first day of fall camp. Right. Uh, you sign a, a booklet, it's probably, it's probably an hour long meeting of, of you just signing stuff and, and compliance and uh, VUPD and just different meetings, just getting it all out of the way. Um, I don't really think most guys read it very closely and really understand that they <laughs> are kind of getting you over in a way. Um, that's maybe a little yeah. strong to say, but I no, mean, uh, you, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think uh, I think most people agree with you at this point. Uh, uh, there's there's still strong opposition, but um, yeah. So um, I signed it, and I just added a little note that it was with the understanding that I had to sign it in order to not only not be eligible to play because they that was um, kind of their their argument back to me, but in order to actually play on the field because if they were to show me a TV broadcast without my written permission and, and signing away my, uh, my name, image, and likeness rights to that, to that form, they would be liable. So, uh, yeah, they're not going to put you on the field if you don't sign right. it. Yeah. Okay, so you, you mentioned opposition. Now, I mean, while you were an active player, did you hear a lot of criticism from opposing fans? Did you get any grief on Twitter? Were people emailing you about this coming from the other side? I mean, what... Inserting yourself into that battle, did it have any significant negative effects while you're still a student? Um, uh, no, no, not not 
not a significant amount at all. Um, I got some some negative backlash when I initially joined it. Uh, maybe right after the first press release announcing the current players that had joined, mostly from from video game fans that uh, thought this was just us trying to get money from from just the video game. Um, Where were uh, they? So they was, the downfall of NCAA football 2015. What say that again? Were they were they blaming you for the downfall of NCAA football 15? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now you've ruined uh, the 2015 video games for everyone, and, and I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, not not too much backlash now. Okay, um, so so let's shift gears to say in the legal realm. Uh, you had your share of injuries as a college athlete, and you had teammates, most notably guys like Warren Norman, who were forced to leave the sport due to health concerns. Uh, do you think think that the NCAA is going to be is liable for the health of its players after they leave college, and and do you maybe see a lawsuit similar to the NFL's concussion suit coming towards the league in in the future? Is there is there not already a lawsuit? I think there's already a couple of lawsuits. Um, um, I'm not really I'm not too well versed in in um, that particular issue. Um, I, I have done a couple. I actually did some some research projects in college on on CTE and some of the different um, head trauma issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know as as it is now, I don't think there there is a policy that requires the schools to be um, to to cover the medical costs associated with injuries that athletes experienced during their time. I think I think Vanderbilt's plan is they'll cover your injuries for for one or two years after you play. Um, then after that, you're on your own. Um, but yeah, if if you can prove that, I mean, you suffered the injury. Um, Essentially working for Vandy and and playing sports for Vandy, uh, they should probably. I mean, I think they should cover you um, forever. I mean, it's fair to me. I mean, I, honestly, I'm not too well versed in, in that issue though. Yeah. So when you say they they give you coverage for one or two years afterwards, is, I mean, is that only for? I, mean, I imagine it's only for students that stay close to Nashville or, or graduates that stay close to Nashville. Or does that apply it, to anyone? It well, I would. I'm not exactly sure. I don't have any injuries that require um, further further care. Um, that's, I mean, that's good to hear. That's that's yeah, great. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they would probably probably have to come back to, to the Nashville area and, and use the team doctors. Um, but yeah, so yeah, they'll cover you if it's if it's an injury you experienced at Vandy. All right. Um, so. Last week we had Kyle Fuller on, and he pointed out the you know, the benefits of playing in it for an SEC program that we don't normally see, the respect, the girls. He also brought up some of the downsides, uh, primarily you know hangers on, people that are coming in just to use you. Did you have any problems with the people who tried to enter your life because they saw you as a status symbol once you were a starting linebacker for uh, a bowl bound SEC team? I mean, was there any people that saw you out strictly because you were Chase Garnum and not because they knew you as a person? No, not at all. <laughs> really? No, not at all. All right. All right. Um, and then back to one more thing we, we talked about with Kyle. Um, obviously, the uh, the big deal uh, out you know, a few miles east in, uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, big academic scandal. Uh, obviously, Vandy is, uh, is a university of similar academic prestige, but uh, obviously they, they try to take great care of their student-athletes. Could you ever see a wide-blown academic scandal taking place at Vanderbilt, similar to the one that the Tar Heels are going through right now? No, no, I couldn't. Um, it's, to me, it's just really surprising that how, how widespread theirs was, how, how many people, how many faculty members were involved. I mean, it, I don't know. I just, I just think that, I don't, that's, it's really surprising to me. Um, particularly at Vandy, I mean, you have, you have some professors that enjoy um, – Teaching athletes more than others, and, and are more fans of the sports teams than others are. Some, I mean, some could care less, you know, who you are. But to have that many professors um, join in to to, <laughs> to uh, that's some widespread abuse. Really surprising. Yeah. yeah. All right, I, I think that's all I got for you, Chase. Uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time, coming around, hanging out, and and telling us all about not only your Vandy career. Um, but really giving us some insight into the Edo Bannon trial and your role on that. that. That's great stuff, and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you having me. It was fun. Hey, man, oh, we'll have to do it again sometime. Uh, yeah. Maybe after the season's over, we can do a post-mortem mortem on the uh, the Vandy defense and see what mm -hmm. went right and what went wrong. 
All right, I'll try to pay a little more attention to <laughs> better analysis of their defensive problems. All right, that sounds good. Um, before we break, I got a sponsor's note here. Uh, this episode of Door to Door brought to you by Bosco's in Nashville. Bosco's, we don't exist anymore. That's not a great tagline <laughs> for them. All right. Oh, so uh, thank you, Bosco's, for putting us on. Uh, thank you, Chase, for coming by. Uh, we'll have this out, and you can catch all the episodes of Door to Door right here at the Anchor of Gold YouTube channel on anchorofgold.com. And, Chase, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you on Twitter? At ChuckG36. Don't, don't tweet too uh, consistently anymore, but, yeah, yeah, give me a follow. All right. Chase Garnham, thank you very much for being on. Uh, we'll catch up with you later. Yeah, sounds good. appreciate it. All right.